Thank you for joining us tonight as we present a preview of MMI's most comprehensive and foundational fellowship course, Module 8, Clinical Practice Protocols. This course includes interactive case presentations and the opportunity to connect with our expert faculty and fellowship co-chairs. We are so excited to have Dr. Heyman with us tonight to highlight clinical cases. Dr. Andrew Heyman is an internationally recognized expert in integrative medicine. He is currently the program director of integrative and metabolic medicine at the George Washington University. Prior to assuming his role, he spent 16 years at the University of Michigan serving to build one of the largest and most successful academic-based integrative medicine programs in the United States. Dr. Heyman remains clinically active as well as the owner of a four-physician integrative medicine practice in Northern Virginia at the Virginia Center for Health and Wellness. His teaching approach is described as deeply rooted in scientific evidence, grounded in the clinical reality of expert patient care, and readily accessible to both the new learner and seasoned practitioner alike. Thank you so much, Dr. Heyman. I'm going to turn the webinar over to you. Great, thanks. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, thanks everybody for attending tonight. Um, you know, we've given a lot of thought to this particular weekend and feel that it needs to be a summary in a sense of all of the other foundational uh, courses that are in the fellowship and also ensure that uh, you're able to take this information and apply it in your clinical practice uh, in a way that's meaningful to you and meaningful to your patients. Um, this sort of collaboration that we've done among the, um, the chairs, as it were, of Metabolic um, Medical Institute, including myself, uh, Jim Laval, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, um, we've taken a lot of time to um, think about, well, what, what do we see in our practices on a regular basis, and what are the problems that we're all trying to solve? Um, and I think what you'll find is that uh, for each of the lectures, uh, as well as case presentations and the way we organize information, it probably will feel a lot like uh, the kinds of patients that you normally see in your own practices as well. And what I hope that we're able to do is both uh, marry uh, good evidence with um, uh, dealing with the clinical reality. And one of the things that I'm fond of saying, and it really is true, is that the longer you practice this style of medicine, um, a couple things happen. One is the less able you are to define it. I think, you know, we all start off uh, in some ways in our own camps with labels. Uh, many, of course, start conventionally, but not all. We think of ourselves as a family practitioner or a uh, physician assistant or a cardiologist or a surgeon. You know, we have these labels that define us. And we enter this new world. Uh, maybe it's through the door of anti-aging. Maybe it's through the door of functional or uh, integrative. And we all end up in sort of a new space in the way that we uh, see ourselves and see our patients. Uh, but I find that even those labels start to fall away at some point. And part of that is because there's so much overlap uh, with what's being taught out there in, in this sort of style of practice. But maybe even more importantly, the longer you care for patients, the more complex they become. And you end up sort of becoming a specialist, in a sense, in a lot of areas because you see the sickest of the sick. And so I'm very interested in ensuring that people who go through our training program feel prepared for that phenomenon. Uh, you know, it's not enough to just know how to do the typical functional tests. Those are only going to take you so far. And I think we, we've all learned that uh, sometimes the hard way uh, with respect to patients that never seem to get better. And while sometimes, um, you know, it, patients are relatively straightforward and end up being a nutrient deficiency or a bit of a hormonal imbalance, I think you'll find that um, just like I have and just like the other co-chairs have had uh, the experience that our patients uh, become sicker and more complex. And so uh, this weekend is designed to help you deal with that complexity and tie it to something foundational uh, with respect to, again, both the, the science that sits behind this style of medicine, uh, but also, uh, you know, translate that into something that makes sense uh, in your personal practices. So that's sort of the, the theme or goal uh, of this weekend in, in a broad sense. And, and, it, it, and again, it comes from that imperative that we each uh, see patients. And we've seen them for a long time. And, and I certainly know that at my practice and at, at other practices like mine, like Jim Laval's, for example, 
we don't have a filter at our door. We don't self-describe as just being hormone docs or just doing weight loss or just doing this or just doing that. And so it, it provides for a very large fund of knowledge and deep clinical experience. And we've tried to inject the entire weekend uh, with that spirit, in a sense. So clinical practice protocols is, in some ways, the summation of uh, not only a lot of years of learning on, on your side, I would imagine, but also uh, certainly uh, from our experience as well. So the objectives of the weekend. Um, we start with this notion of a clinical systems biology approach to complex patients. And it's this idea that the body is interconnected in very specific ways. Uh, we start from that premise. And the reason why we start from that premise is because as your patients become more complicated, uh, you really do need to become a dot connector. And that is to say, look at patterns of symptoms, look at patterns of lab abnormalities, and begin to see the crosstalk or relationships that are occurring from a metabolic perspective uh, within that particular patient. And when you can identify those patterns uh, in appropriate ways, then uh, patients really do begin to unfold for you in a sense. And what seemed to be complicated begins to make more and more sense. We have a few different ways of addressing that issue uh, within the context of this particular weekend. One model of which, but it's not a model we sort of spread across all lectures in all cases, but we do in, um, certainly insert it commonly throughout the weekend is using our triad model. And that is to say, we break the body down into its component parts in a sense and we look at important crosstalk components. Um, and so this notion that you know the body is a system of systems, but we can capitalize on that knowledge uh, both because of its functional as well as anatomical relationships and apply sort of a, a, a clinical sensibility uh, to that knowledge base. And so we weave that through the entire uh, weekend. I would say in some sense, um, this is the spirit of the functional medicine matrix, um, but I think that that model, um, it, while um, inspires individuals to think differently, uh, can become quite cumbersome in its applicability. And so we needed to find a different way of looking at um, physiology that was even more consistent with the evidence, but also had a utility about it. So we've broken the body down into these subunits uh, called triads, which I'll talk about in a little while. And again, we don't use it as a teaching principle throughout the entire weekend, but, but we do use it. And we, we think of it as a systems biology approach. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be reviewing common patient presentations across multiple medical specialties, meaning that we draw on experts from various fields and we begin to create um, the sort of ties that um, allow us to link um, uh, common cases across specialties in a sense. So we've thought about what does that look like over the course of the uh, three days as well. Um, we certainly want you to develop successful clinical treatment approaches and we do that again based on identifying and correcting key metabolic disturbances. We talk about that quite a bit and so there's a rhythm in terms of lecturing cases and lecturing cases so that we give you the foundational principles and uh, evidence base for what we're what we want you to focus on as a clinician, and then we turn around and have you go through uh, real cases. And so we bring in um, uh, labs that we've drawn from our own practices uh, to sort of shape the discussion. Uh, we, start, we also want you to enhance your clinical skills uh, in patient interviewing assessment and plan development. So we do expect you to develop real treatment plans and as much deliver that plan to the group you know, one of the things that uh, certainly I've identified um, as a key component uh, of being a complete professional is your ability to uh, establish open lines of communication and uh, develop trust within the therapeutic relationship. And that means, especially in this kind of practice, because sometimes the plans can be complicated, that you're very clear in your delivery you're clear in how you look at complicated issues and that you demonstrate to us that you can deliver a plan in a way that would make sense not only to us as uh, professionals and colleagues but also to patients which is even more important that there's sort of a language we want you to use with respect to um, how you characterize the imbalances or issues that's going on with your patient and then what you're going to do uh, to correct those imbalances so you know I'm always listening for how sophisticated is this individual with respect to delivering a plan that makes sense to a patient. 
We also uh, um, focus on sort of the lifestyle issues, uh, specifically diet and exercise. I think sometimes these get overlooked or we feel that um, in its most basic sense all you need to do is pull carbs out of the diet and run a food panel. Uh, I think that's what most practitioners end up doing to one degree or another. Uh, but we spend quite a bit of time reinforcing dietary theory, choosing between diets, and ensuring that you understand um, how to apply diet and exercise prescription in various patient populations. That these foundational issues are what often create the largest changes in your patients regardless of the diagnoses uh, that they carry. So um, we take a systems biology approach. We also look at common patient presentations. We then break um, information out based on uh, medical specialties as well. And then we have you begin pulling it all together, uh, demonstrating comp competency as you present to the group um, how you look at a particular patient and deliver that plan. And we ensure that you're grounded in sort of the lifestyle issues um, that cut across all of, the, all of those domains. So the outline, uh, we have didactic lectures. Um, and that includes both clinical and evidence-based as well as focusing on nutrition and lifestyle. Um, we even uh, are focusing on patient interviews to some degree. Um, we have open discussion periods. A lot of this is group-based. Uh, so yes, you'll be receiving uh, conventional teaching through you know, those didactic lectures, but then we break you out into groups and you work with your colleagues to um, apply what you've learned in, from the intellectual point of view uh, as you're sort of grasping with new knowledge or reinforcing knowledge. Uh, but then we also want you to demonstrate a skill set. And the skill set is critical thinking, analysis, plan development, and also delivery. And so we always call on people within groups to deliver the plan to the entire class. And so that reinforces um, your ability to um, really uh, ground yourself in the plan and, and, and understand what it is that you're, you're recommending, but also demonstrate your ability to convey that plan in key ways. Um, we also look at special cases, and, and that is to say some more complex topics, um, as well as sort of archetypal patients and key concepts. So we're always going back and forth between what's foundational knowledge and then uh, and sort of what's 2.0. You know, how do I go to the next level? How do I break free of sort of the you know, typical lines of discussion that I'm sure many of you have in your practice daily with respect to, you talk about food sensitivities and adrenal fatigue and hormonal imbalance and inflammation and nutrient deficiencies, but how do I go to the next level? Is that model good enough with respect to dealing with these complex patients? And, and I would say even that only takes you so far. So we're trying to break free of some of the um, sort of inherent biases that we see in our field and uh, have you think even more differently. And I'll, I'll have some examples of that even in this lecture to give you a flavor of, of what I mean in that regard. So um, we self-define as metabolic medicine. We're the Metabolic uh, Medical Institute. And that is to say, as we've struggled with identifying ourselves in one form or another, metabolism um, is probably the, the best description because it is a reflection of all of the external and internal forces and factors that generate health or illness. And so certainly there are other labels uh, that we can argue or combine, but to be very precise, you know, we do like this, this notion of uh, metabolism. And it, you know, uh, for us it explains uh, that interconnectedness um, and, and to honor the fact that this really is about the whole body and the whole person, um, but that you know, our focus is on the metabolic expression of, of the entirety of that, that person's life. And of course, we assess and intervene at all levels, mind, body, and spirit. But uh, metabolism is, is that sort of anchor in our physical reality that we can measure and manipulate and intervene on that um, you know, is, is important for us uh, to identify with as we you know, shape and move the whole field forward. Um, and this metabolism operates on the cellular and even subcellular level all the way up through organ systems. And so um, we're always looking at deeper ways of assessing what's going on with our patients and understanding the patterns of um, expression, if you want to call it that, uh, that, that we see in our, in our patient population. And so we want to improve health and decrease negative forces on, on these metabolic processes in very key ways. And the reason why uh, we like the systems biology approach in particular is that 
um, you know, metabolism is messy, and it's easy to go to a specific lecture, lecture and get excited about understanding in more detail one bodily process or another, and we begin to think that if we can just measure neurotransmitters or gut health or hormones or stress or toxins, um, those ideas become frameworks that are, are doorways, in a sense, that you want to walk through and explore to create better health and balance in your patients. And you'll hear things like, well, you have to balance the adrenals before you fix the thyroid or so on and so forth. But the reality is, is the body's even more complex than that. And it's this incredible um, uh, set of interconnected processes where one um, piece is always speaking with and communicating with and influencing other processes and vice versa. And so oftentimes, especially in that functional medicine model, it's easy to measure something and capture imbalances. Um, but are you really looking at phenomenon or epiphenomenon? What's really the cause of why this patient is sick as opposed to an excess or a deficiency? And I certainly will admit that I've fallen into that trap uh, over the years and realized that I was just practicing conventional medicine but, but using different labels. And I thought, well, if cortisol is low, I have to raise it. Or if, you know, an oxidative stress marker is high, I have to lower it, thinking that if I just fix the leaves on the tree, um, this patient will get better. And I think many of you probably have had the same experience that I've had where you end up going down those paths, uh, you spend a lot of time, patients are spending a lot of money, and they're just not really getting better. And so um, the reason why a systems biology approach, an organized approach, makes a lot of sense is because we break metabolism down into its uh, important subsets or subunits. And we know that uh, diseases tend to aggregate around these subunits, and so do symptoms and therefore treatments. Um, and so we try and make it easy with respect to understanding those sliding edges that have particular importance within a patient's physiology and begin to characterize what that looks like in, in real, real time. Um, and I think as the pr process unfolds over the course of the weekend, you'll begin making these connections in more and more natural ways. And it begins to alleviate the confusion that I see in individuals as they go through these learning experiences and they tend to get overwhelmed by the amount of information that's being taught and it's very hard to put the patient back together. It feels like Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall and is in a thousand different parts and you just don't know where to begin because it feels like any one issue could be driving the entire set of problems. Should you do a food panel? Should you do hormones? Should you check cortisol? Uh, should you fix the gut? It's hard to know. And so we want to give you a framework that allows you to uh, work through these issues methodically. So uh, the triads themselves, uh, again, this is sort of our framework. It's the conceptual model of, of how we look at uh, the body based on a systems biology approach. It's out of 30 years of research and experience. And the goal is to, um, uh, you know, elucidate an organized method of um, collecting data, both biologic as well as uh, self-report, and then generating a path forward with respect to where the major imbalances are and how to treat those imbalances over time. So it's a system or approach, and we feel that it um, is very meaningful in the way that, you know, it shapes the discussion, it shapes how you look at labs, and it allows you to drill down pretty quickly into what's going on with the patient. So um, we typically rely on five triads uh, in the way that we organize our thinking. Uh, this is sort of the base model with respect to uh, the uh, subdomains. Uh, there are five of them that together comprise a significant portion of the individual's metabolism from a systems perspective. Um, and so the first is adrenal thyroid pancreas, which is stress metabolism and sugar. Uh, patients understand it from that perspective. It is the individual that is under stress and as a result reaching for carbohydrates, driving up their insulin, and their thyroid uh, is becoming impaired as a result. And so uh, we have a number of patient cases that represent that particular phenomenon. Usually by balancing the three hormones associated with this particular triad and really focusing on the lifestyle issues of diet and exercise and stress management, it, this is relatively easy to correct. The second gut immune brain has to do with three whole body systems. They're anatomically related as well as functionally. Uh, many complex diseases arise out of these uh, relationships, but it takes only 
you know, a moment in time to go to Google and search for gut brain axis or gut immune axis or immune brain axis and all sorts of fabulous research comes up showing the relationships in and among these three uh, body systems. Uh, I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail as an example. Liver, lymph, kidney, um, we have several perspectives on this. The first is uh, we certainly don't uh, hear enough about how to drain people of toxins and exposures. This is sort of the environmental medicine triad. And in particular, there's not enough attention played on the kidneys. And so uh, we spend quite a bit of time looking at how do you support kidney function, how do you drain the body of exposures, how do you limit exposures in general on your patients. Cardiopulmonary neurovascular, uh, so this is the relationship between the brain and the heart as mediated through um, the pulmonary tree and the autonomic nervous system. So uh, we look at the relationship between uh, stress, chronic inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, and central nervous system problems. Uh, you know, there's a strong relationship between heart disease and uh, neurocognitive disorders such as Alzheimer's. And so, you know, we, we like to pair those two together because it, it really is true from a sort of uh, symptom perspective as well as a, a biological perspective that, you know, as the old saying, saying goes, as is the heart, so does the brain. And so what's good for the heart really is good for the brain. And then finally, where I think many of us sort of start off, and some of us remain here in a sense because this really defines our practice, is hormone balancing. This is classic anti-aging. It's estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. You know, how do we uh, successfully deal with uh, issues in this particular triad? And I think many of us uh, would agree that sometimes patients are really hard to get right uh, with respect to balancing their hormones. And I think my opinion, and, and I know others are too, that usually you have to balance everything else uh, before you can really get to uh, the reproductive hormones, unless the person is already relatively healthy. Um, so we take this sort of whole body, whole system uh, based approach. We sort of sprinkle this throughout the weekend so you get a flavor for how do we look at these issues through this particular lens. It allows you to connect the dots more quickly in your complex patients. We also break, uh, break the topics apart in, you know, as I mentioned before, medical specialties or clinical domains that you're probably even more familiar with. And so we want to do both. We take a systems biology perspective, but we also are uh, entrenched, and rightly so, in sort of, you know, the traditional categories. Lifestyle medicine, which is nutrition, exercise, and stress, uh, stress management. Uh, in particular, um, I certainly know I spend a lot of time talking about that in, with my patients. Uh, and then we have specific sessions on autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammation, cardiology, endocrinology, gastroenterology, toxicology, and neurology. These are many of our foundational or core topics that, you know, we, we know everyone sees in their practice in one form or another on a routine basis. And then we begin to tie these uh, concepts together through that systems biology approach as well. So you get a heavy dose of uh, again, this sort of traditional silo-based, uh, you know, how do I treat hypertension, as well as that systems-oriented um, uh, uh, approach as well. So in the sense of, or in the spirit of uh, showing you a little bit of how we sort of do the 2.0, I've taken the liberty of inserting some slides with respect to gut immune brain and, um, you know, showing how the power of that model begins to articulate and elucidate um, some of the more complex patients that you'll see in your practice. It's often that patient that's talking about brain fog and fatigue, cognitive decline, anxiety and depression, uh, peripheral neuropathies, autonomic dysfunction, uh, POT syndrome, uh, gastro gastroparesis, gallbladder dyskinesia, um, you know, a variety of vague but persistent symptoms that a patient will often complain of and just don't seem to get better with your standard uh, intervention. And so we can walk through that doorway just with a very simple question of, do you have brain fog? A lot of patients who have brain fog have significant neuroinflammatory problems. And so um, the gut immune brain model is a way of beginning to organize, well, where do I look? Uh, uh, within a patient uh, who's complaining of uh, this kind of set of symptoms. So we know it's a decline in executive function. Uh, we know there's an injury to neurons. Uh, we know that that injury can occur because of toxins or infections or just um, specific microglial inflammation. It can be changes in pressure within the brain. Uh, we also um, 
can demonstrate because of ongoing inflammation, uh, dendritic pruning, which is loss of connections and, and branching within the dendrites, or even atrophy, which is uh, true damage to uh, neurons in the brain. Um, and so the reason why I'm putting this up here is because when you have patients with gut immune brain, when they're complaining of irritable bowel symptoms and uh, joint pain and myalgias and fatigue and brain fog and depression, um, yes, there can be metabolic and functional issues uh, that need to be corrected, uh, but also um, in the work that I've done and others have done, it, as we've begun to characterize these patients, there are very specific architectural or, or brain-related changes that, that are actually measurable. And we've been able to identify that in our practice, and it's sort of linking what feels like a very functional approach with a more traditional appreciation of end organ damage. And in the same way that poor vascular flow through the coronary arteries leads to heart disease and poor pump function and the risk for heart failure, so too uh, do these sort of early inflammatory changes and vascular related changes uh, related to the brain ultimately can lead to architectural problems and uh, they come in two flavors, those, that dendritic pruning as well as the atrophy. So dendritic pruning is a very hot topic, and it relates to those beautiful dendrites that should be branched as they're coming off the back of the neuron. And they're receiving information in a three-dimensional uh, frame from uh, all the surrounding neurons, and this is how cells in the brain communicate with each other. But when you assault the brain with a traumatic brain injury or chronic inflammation because of a toxin or infection, um, we see loss of that volume. We see dendritic uh, retraction or pruning. Stress does this. Infections do it. Biotoxic exposures do it. Um, and so, um, you know, this is such an important issue because with this volume loss comes persistent symptoms. And so the generator of those changes are usually happening within the framework of gut immune brain, but the end organ damage is in the, is in the brain itself. Um, we also know that if you can correct that inflammation from within the nervous or the immune system, there is a potential for um, improving uh, and restoring uh, that dendritic health. And that is to say a restoration of plasticity and improving those connections. And it's possible. We, we've shown that. Others have shown it too. And this is a really important topic. Um, it's all being driven by microglial cells in the brain. They release a variety of uh, neurotoxic factors, these are cytokines and proteins um, that injure uh, local dendrites, and we see uh, retraction in, in areas. So here we have that direct relationship between the immune system and the brain. Um, and in addition to that, you can create a, um, further pressure or, or force on the immune system through gut-related issues. So if patients are consuming uh, food that's further triggering their immune system, they can get brain-related changes. If that food is covered in mold or mycotoxins, they can get brain-related changes. So once again, it's this um, notion of gut immune brain that's so important. And a lot of it in terms of the brain-related changes is being driven by microglial cells. Um, this is what we don't want. You don't want atrophy uh, because as you further inflame the brain and you see these uh, architectural alterations, um, uh, you can form scar tissue, that certain areas of the brain become non-functional. And really the only way to know if it's pruning versus atrophy uh, is with successful treatment and you decrease inflammation and whether or not there's restoration of normal brain function. So this is an example of what we do in my practice. We do um, uh, MRIs, they're structural MRIs, uh, based on what's called neuroquant. This is a quantification uh, of 11 key centers in the brain based on volume. It's a mathematical algorithm that's incredibly accurate and detailed. And so here we're beginning to segment key areas of the brain uh, based on a volumetric assessment. And this is what the report looks like. And so you have different views. Um, and uh, the uh, neuroquant algorithm will allow us to characterize um, the size of those areas based on volume. And they'll report it in, in various ways. But if you look at the um, the column, the second to the right, uh, RH volume, you can see the numbers from 34.3 all the way down to 4.16. Uh, the kind of data that we've collected in, in my practice and others are looking at whether or not certain areas of the brain uh, have swollen or do we see uh, shrinkage. And we know that those changes are signatures or characteristics, characteristics of exposures that have triggered the immune system. And those um, inflammatory processes will um, unfortunately induce 
uh, these sorts of architectural changes in the brain. And sometimes if we get a little lucky with a very clear brain scan, um, it will tell us what the, what, pac what the patient has been exposed to. And uh, where this leads then is a real focus on cleaning up the gut, decreasing inflammation, reducing exposure to biotoxins, uh, and then starting down the pathway of, of healing the, the damage that's occurred to the brain. Where this really dovetails or fits well with what we teach is, of course, a lot of our strategies we like to focus on being natural, natural compounds or, or lifestyle related, um, as opposed to using drug therapy. And so um, this is a deeper expression of a gut immune brain pathology, um, but I'm pointing it out because I want to show that, you know, what we're teaching is not standard fair that in fact, um, you know, we want to take you to the next level because we do recognize that your patients will likely be very sick. And once you've done the standard things and you're still scratching your head and you're confused, uh, we want to show you there's another door that you can walk through. And it might, we might be using terms or measurement tools that you're not necessarily familiar with, but we'll talk about them and we'll show you how to use them. So gut immune brain pathology, um, it's pretty typical in patients as they express with bloating and gas and autoimmune issues or impaired immunity or chronic inflammatory processes. They often have expression of that inflammation with mood-related changes, cognitive decline, brain fog and fatigue, and uh, uh, disrupted sleep. So these are your patients that typically come in with the label of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, depression, anxiety. Uh, they're usually on a lot of narcotics, anti-inflammatory, sleep aids. You know the drill. And Sometimes you make a little bit of progress with them, but I know this is a particularly difficult patient population, and we'll show you how to dissect them. So what are some broader symptoms that you'll see in these patients that are really sick within gut immune brain? They'll be fatigued, they'll have memory uh, issues and um, we're finding difficulty, poor concentration, uh, stiff joints, achy muscles, abnormal skin sensations, uh, neurolog neurologic issues of numbness or tingling, uh, orthostatic problems, uh, lightheadedness, blurry vision, uh, ice pick headaches and pains, abdominal pain, diarrhea. Um, so clearly, you know, gut immune brain, uh, but these are very complicated patients. And uh, here's an example of if you see a patient like this, where do we start? Well, we talk about specific markers like DAO, which is a measure of histamine production or, or the uh, body's ability to break down histamine in the gut, lipopolysaccharides, melanocyte stimulating hormone. Yes, food sensitivities, although I, I have to say I've grown more and more critical of these companies. You know, the variances are too large. We're looking at 20 to 30 percent. I think um, we have all had that experience. We're just not sure that if an IgG is elevated, what does it really mean? There are some companies that do high sensitivity testing, and their variance is only 2 to 4% or so, and they're much more reliable. But there's only a handful of those companies, and, and there might not even be ones that you've heard of, and they're quite expensive. Uh, acid aldehyde, which is a byproduct of yeast overgrowth. In the immune system, you know, typical markers like CRP, set rate, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, common markers of autoimmunity. Uh, but then we get into some of the innate immune markers that have been incredibly helpful in my practice. MMP9, C3A, C4A, TGF-beta-1, CD4, CD25, anti-cardiolipid antibodies, von Willebrand's factor, D-dimer. All of this is to say that you have to start fishing for a measurable toxins um, and uh, infection uh, because we know that once you trigger that innate immune response, you have to start looking for um, exposures such as uh, mold and, and, and chronic bacterial infection, so on and so forth. The consequences are in the brain. We see degradation of the blood-brain barrier through elevated beta-2 microglobulin. There's all sorts of proprietary panels now that are going to be hitting the market very soon, uh, looking at um, how do we better metabolically characterize brain injury. Uh, certainly uh, at the genetic level, MTHFR, although I think you know there's going to be all sorts of players in that space, and, and we still don't really understand what much of that means, although I know people say they do. Um, there are uh, neuropeptides such as vasoactive intestinal peptide as well as uh, growth factors such as VEGF, um, MSH, which is master regulatory hormone produced in the hypothalamus, all of which can characterize in better terms changes in the brain uh, that are peripheral markers that are measurable. Uh, volumetric brain imaging, so neuroquant, and then even visual contrast study, which is a sort of a quick and dirty um, assessment of neuroinflammation. Um, so we're beginning to expand how you're thinking. If you, um, if you really look closely, you'll be hard-pressed to find very many functional markers 
uh, sort of in the classic sense. We appreciate those, but we feel like in your really sick patients, they become less and less important. Um, so here's a list of a number of uh, dietary supplements and natural compounds that we might use to begin to correct um, patients who have these issues um, across all three domains. And these lists can get very, very long with respect to uh, dealing with patients such as this. And the list is actually longer than even what I'm looking at, especially in my own practice. Uh, but this just gives you a sense of how we begin to group not only symptoms, but labs and also supplements. Um, so that's a very brief overview of um, what we'll be doing with uh, clinical practice protocols. Uh, it's extremely organized, it's case-based, it's group work. We expect you to synthesize that knowledge, use your analytical skills, and demonstrate over the course of the three days your ability to um, evaluate a case and deliver a plan that makes sense. So we use lots of different methods, whether it's a systems biology approach or more traditional uh, medical specialty-based topics. Um, we expect you to be very participatory, and we want to make sure that your plans uh, reflect sort of across the domains of lifestyle issues, metabolic issues, um, and, you know, sort of the full complement or toolkit that you really do have at your disposal outside of, you know, pharmaceuticals and, and surgery. Um, so it's an exciting weekend. It really is amazing. When I look back at the last one that we just did, how much the students learned over the course of three days, uh, even the seasoned ones, where we're always looking to create that clinical pearl, that moment of, you know, aha. And uh, that definitely happens here uh, more than I think than, than in any other weekend. And so if you're thinking about um, taking the course, I would really strongly urge you to do it because I think you're going get, to get a lot out of it. Um, so thanks for attending, and um, I'm happy to stay on if, if anyone has, has questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Heyman. I would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Um, and we do look forward to seeing you in Las Vegas. The dates for Module 8 will be on December 11th through the 13th. Um, be sure to give your education advisor a call today. Um, you can always reach us at 561-777-6807. Um, Dr. Heyman, I don't see any questions now, but if anyone does have one, please feel free to give us an email and um, Dr. Heyman will, uh, will reply. Um, thank you so much and have a fantastic evening.